Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu Halt die Klappe, ähm, heute mit Professor Barry Alessio ist bei Fellow ähm, in der äh, invasiven Hämodynamik, Brusttiermodell und natürlich auch am Menschen. Äh, wir hosten das heute gemeinsam. Mein Name ist Tobias Trippel und wir fühlen uns sehr geehrt, dass wir heute einen äh, der weltbekanntesten Experten auf dem Bereich im Gebiet der invasiven Hämodynamik haben, Professor Borlow. Professor Borlow ist ähm, ausgebildet worden an der University of Wisconsin, war am Brigham and Women's Hospital ähm, in Boston, an Johns Hopkins, ähm, an der Johns Hopkins Universität und hat dann ähm, an der Mayo Clinic, der wahrscheinlich weltbesten Institution ähm, in der Medizin, die ja nach den World Rankings immer die Nummer eins auch anführt, eine Professur für Circulatory Failure. Uh, Prof, we are wechseln jetzt auf English. Professor Borlo, thank you so much that you found the time for us uh, to teach us about invasive hemo hemodynamics from aortic stenosis uh, to HEFPEF, and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So let me get the screen here. Okay, can you see this? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so... Uh, As Tobias said, uh, I'm going to talk about invasive cardiac hemodynamics. We'll focus mostly on HEFPEF. Uh, these are my disclosures. So this is the objective in the next 35 minutes or so. We'll review the role of non-invasive and particularly invasive hemodynamic assessment and evaluation of HEFPEF and other cardiac disorders. I think it's important first to review what HEFPEF is. Um, and I would define HEFPEF as an inability of the heart to pump blood adequately to the body at normal filling pressures, at rest and with exercise in a patient with a normal EF where we've excluded other um, different causes that we'll talk about. So we make this diagnosis clinically looking for objective evidence of myocardial dysfunction. And we most commonly look for this evidence through things like physical exam, echocardiography, so jugular distension or radiography findings, um, uh, elevation in NT pro BNP level, other echo findings like high EE prime. When these aren't uh, definitive, we do cardiac catheterization to directly measure filling pressures. And then we also um, sometimes look for evidence of inadequate cardiac output that can be estimated by cardiopulmonary exercise testing or measured directly at cath lab. The other important component is to exclude other etiologies that we treat differently from so-called primary garden variety heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But this definition is very important moving forward because it contains uh, measurable objective um, quantities. Now, there are a number of guidelines. This is from the 2016 ESC guidelines, um, how to work up for HEFPEF. Uh, it relies largely on the presence of a high BNP. If the natriuretic peptide levels are not elevated, uh, it was considered in this algorithm not to be HEFPEF. If it was, they went on to do an echo, and uh, there had to be other evidence, either left atrial enlargement, LV hypertrophy, or high um, filling pressures estimated by echo. This scheme seemed like it worked well, but uh, when we tested this, uh, it didn't. It was very specific, but it's poorly sensitive, only 60% sensitivity from this um, older approach from a couple of years ago. So um, some important points to remember uh, is that a uh, N normal NT pro BNP or BNP level does not exclude HEFPEF. Uh, we have observed that almost 20% of patients have NT pro BNP levels of below 125. 30% below 200, 40% uh, below 300. And these are invasively proven patients. And this is also reflected in the latest uh, guidelines from the ESC HFA PEF score. Um, normal BNP does not exclude HEFPEF. So it's very important to remember. The other thing we often look at on the echocardiogram is the E to E prime ratio. And as you can see here, this is that's related, it's correlated to directly measured um, LV and diastolic pressure or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, and when you look at patients with HEFPEF as compared to non-cardiac dyspnea controls, um, the distributions here are very different, but you can also appreciate that a lot of patients with HEFPEF have normal um, e to E prime values at rest. And that's because they have normal filling pressures at rest. Um, so if the E to E prime ratio is high, that's informative, but if it's not elevated, that again, doesn't exclude HEFPEF. Uh, a lot of times people will perform cardiopulmonary exercise testing to measure peak oxygen consumption. 
which is the gold standard measure of aerobic capacity. And when you compare people with HFPEF to uh, controls, again, you can see very different distribution of data here, highly significant. Um, but really you see here that in this gray zone between 14 and 20, there's a lot of overlap between patients with HFPEF and controls. And in fact, when you convert absolute peak VO2 um, to percent predicted using a normative equation from Wasserman, um, that actually makes it even worse. So you can see the overlap is greater here. So cardiopulmonary testing is not that helpful to make the diagnosis of HFPEF or to exclude other causes of dyspnea. So let's look at a case, a 70-year-old lady with uh, normal EF, metabolic syndrome, severe symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue, but she's never been admitted for volume overload. She looks pretty euvolemic on exam. There's no jugular distension, normal BNP level. She gets a cardiopulmonary test and her peak VO2 is a little bit depressed, but it's not interpreted to show a cardiac output limitation. And of course you get an echocardiogram and there's a little bit of left atrial enlargement. There's a little bit of diastolic dysfunction. And there's sort of this borderline elevation in RV systolic pressure estimated by echo. These are suggestive uh, of, of heart failure, but certainly not uh, diagnostic. So what do you do in a patient like this? Well, this is, this is exactly the kind of patient um, that should come to the cath lab. Um, to get definitive information. So um, that was, that's what was done here. And you can see the, the red pressure tracing is the LV pressure, left ventricle pressure, and the black is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And you can see they're completely normal. Uh, 12 millimeters of mercury, normal cardiac output, 5.7 liters per minute. But this woman is not symptomatic at rest. She's symptomatic with exercise. So we need to stress her system in order to bring out the abnormalities. You wouldn't tell somebody with uh, exertional chest tightness that they don't have coronary artery disease based on a normal resting ECG. So why would you do that with hemodynamics? So we stress her and with 40 watts of exercise, you can see her, her wedge pressure or LV and diastolic pressure are very, very high now, 40 millimeters of mercury. And this is clearly somebody who has HFPEP. So we showed a number of years ago, 10 years ago now, um, that when you take patients just like this woman to the cath lab, a little over half of them, despite the normal exam, despite a normal echo and BNP, and despite normal resting hemodynamics, will have hemodynamic abnormalities that are diagnostic of heart failure that are only brought about by the stress of exercise. And again, you really need to stress the system because of this intermittent elevation in filling pressures that only happens during exercise and is not apparent at rest in these people. So why are they bad? Well, as your filling pressures go up, uh, it leads to the sensation um, of air hunger, which leads to an increase in inspiratory drive, which causes tachypnea. The patient starts to take on this rapid, shallow pattern of breathing. And you can see that as workload increases, they're breathing much more. And we can see this modest but significant correlation between the increase in left heart filling pressures or wedge pressure and symptoms of dyspnea. Uh, and even if you exclude this outlier here, there's a significant relationship. What happens? Why does this happen? Well, as you have left heart failure and as your pulmonary capillary pressure rises because of left atrial hypertension, you get an increase of fluid filtration because you alter the starling forces in the pulmonary capillaries, causing fluid to leak out from the vascular space into the interstitium. Uh, but in addition to this, uh, patients with combined left heart failure and right heart failure, these are the ones who really get the most pulmonary congestion. That's because people with right ventricular dysfunction get an increase in central venous pressure and central venous pressure is the afterload that affects lymphatic drainage. So as your CVP goes up, you get less pulmonary lymphatic drainage because they ultimately drain via the thoracic duct into the central circulation. This decreases fluid efflux from the lungs. And it's the combination of squeezing the capillaries and then not, um, not wicking away the, uh, the fluid that's in the interstitium that really leads to this dramatic increase in extravascular lung water that we see in over half of patients during exercise um, with HFPEF. 
And you can see that by long ultrasound based on these uh, laser-like beeline artifacts that show up in the lungs, which are indicative of an increase in extravascular lung water. So we know that in patients with HEFPEF, um, greater increases in uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure are associated with poorer exercise capacity, reduced uh, peak VO2. And we also know that um, uh, this is data actually from, from Germany uh, from a number of years ago, that even with people that have normal wedge pressure at rest have a um, substantially higher risk of um, all-cause mortality in long-term follow-up uh, if their wedge pressure goes up during exercise. So it's associated with symptoms, it's associated with uh, poor functional capacity, it's associated with adverse outcomes. So the next question is what causes this elevation? And the thing we think the most about is diastolic dysfunction. And on average, patients with HEFPEF have a diastolic pressure volume relationship, which is shifted up and to the left. So a higher pressure at a common volume. During exercise, this uh, steeper pressure volume relationship acutely stiff, uh, becomes even steeper. Uh, and you can see this dramatic increase in LV and diastolic pressure that develops in patients with HEFPEF. But there's lots of things that lead to this increase in filling pressures, and they seem to differ in different patient phenotypes. And this is one of the things that makes HEFPEF more complicated. There's a number of different phenotypes that lead to this high uh, wedge pressure. One of them is this uh, so, so-called ventricular vascular stiffening, or this stiff heart, stiff artery. So these patients at rest look pretty normal. And you can see down here, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is about 12. As long as they're not doing anything, much like the lady I showed you earlier, they look fine. But they have a reduction in the compliance reserve of the AO, the, their aorta, and they have an increase in vascular stiffness, which increases the velocity of wave reflections. So when these kinds of patients exercise, and when more blood is coming back to this left atrium and left ventricle, it's trying to squeeze this blood out, increasing stroke volume and cardiac output, but the compliance reserve in the aorta is exhausted. Um, so the, the aorta can't accept this without a dramatic increase in aortic systolic pressure and LV systolic pressure. And then there's a dramatic increase in um, arterial wave reflections, which return back to the heart during systole, further augmenting pressure load in addition to an inadequate reduction in systemic vascular resistance. So this basically acutely pressurizes the heart and you get this very dramatic increase in wedge pressure. These people are very, very difficult to treat because you can't just give them a diuretic because they already have normal filling pressures at rest. You need something ideally that's going to remove this uh, stiffening in the heart and artery. And we don't really have good medical therapies right now that can do that effectively. Uh, but this is one patient uh, type, and this is often seen in older uh, patients who are um, less often obese. They often have a lot of uh, systolic hypertension and um, atrial fibrillation, left atrial enlargement. Here's another phenotype. We used to say for years that HEFPEF almost always occurs in people above the age of 60, but now we're clearly, especially in the United States, we're seeing it in people in their 50s, in their 40s, even in their 30s. Um, and as a rule, people that develop HEFPEF before the age of 50 or so almost always have obesity. So this is a lady, 52 year old woman, uh, who had numerous referrals, repeatedly had been told that she's just obese and that's why she's short of breath, but she was finally taken to the cath lab. You can see here, her BNP is completely normal, uh, but in the cath lab, we can see her LVN diastolic pressure and her pulmonary wedge pressure in blue, very high, over 30. So this patient clearly has heart failure despite the low BNP and that's because of the obesity. This is somebody with the obese phenotype of HEFPEF. And these patients um, show many of the same findings that we see in non-obese HEFPEF. They all have diastolic dysfunction. They all have abnormalities in left ventricular strain. But there are some features which are uh, more prominent in this obese phenotype. One of them is that they have more RV remodeling. So they have bigger right ventricles. They have more RV dysfunction than the non-obese patients. The increase in their left heart filling pressures is more strongly tied to their increase in body mass. And we think that this is related to an increase uh, 
in their blood volume and plasma volume, which um, commonly accompanies obesity. These patients have um, more severe exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension. This likely contributes to that uh, greater prevalence of right ventricular dysfunction in obesity-related HFPEF as well. We also have recent evidence that there is an important role for visceral fat. Um, and when you look at uh, subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat, it turns out that it's this visceral fat or fat that's stored around internal organs that is the strongest risk factor for developing HFPEF. We also know that uh, women seem to be more likely to develop HFPEF than men, but they usually outnumber men with HFPEF by about a two to one ratio. To explore this, we conducted a case control study where we took 105 patients with HFPEF, 63 of them women, and they all underwent invasive hemodynamic exercise testing and abdominal CT imaging to directly measure abdominal visceral adipose tissue. These cases were then compared to 105 age, sex, and body mass index matched control patients. And we looked then in a sex stratified analysis. And that's important because naturally men store fat more in their abdomen. Men have more visceral fat than women. Women tend to store fat more in the gluteofemoral region. So it's important to look at this, the sexes differently. So when you compare men with HFPEF to control men, uh, age, sex, or age and BMI matched control men, you see no statistically significant difference in visceral fat. But when you look at women, you see even though women have lower visceral fat as compared to BMI met and age matched women, women with HFPEF have about 30% higher visceral adipose tissue area. So they become sort of more masculine in the way they store fat, and that appears to be important in patients, uh, in, in women with HFPEP. So here's some example CT scans. You can see two women, same BMI, um, but uh, very dramatic differences in visceral fat area. This patient um, has a ton of visceral fat around the, the, the kidneys and gut, um, and this is a typical example that we see in these patients. When you perform linear regression analysis to look at the relationship between visceral fat and exercise wedge pressure, there's no correlation in men uh, overall, uh, but there's a very striking positive relationship that's present in women and a significant, statistically significant interaction between the sexes. When you look at um, the, in, the um, right atrial pressure and pulmonary capillary pressure during exercise, comparing men with normal VAT to high VAT in orange, you see no difference. So this is combining HFPEF and controls together. No difference on account of VAT in men, but in women, very striking difference. Suggests that an excess of visceral adipose tissue plays a particularly prominent role in women, leading to um, the, the female form of HFPEF, which may be a little bit different than the male form of HFPEF. There's also additional um, abnormalities in the venous bed. Um, this is data that's currently um, under revision, uh, so not yet published. Uh, but we looked at um, the pressure dimension uh, relationship as a measure of systemic venous compliance in patients with HFPEF. And here you can see as IVC dimension increases, um, uh, there is, or as, C, as central venous pressure goes up, there's an increase in IVC dimension in both patients with HFPEF and in controls. But for any increase in dimension, there's a much greater increase in pressure in patients with HFPEF. This indicates a reduction in systemic venous compliance. In addition to that, we see abnormalities in what's called capacitance, which is uh, the total amount of the um, venous system to store blood. So normally uh, your 70 kilogram person has about five liters of total blood volume. And this blood volume mostly sits in the veins, about 70% of our blood sits in veins. And it can be broken down into two compartments. One compartment is called the unstressed blood volume. That's the vo total volume of blood in the vasculature that basically fills the vascular split space to zero pressure. Any blood volume in, a, in excess of the unstressed blood volume is called the stressed blood volume. 
The stress blood volume is the volume that increases tension in the blood, in the blood vessels. And this is what forces, propels blood back to the heart through venous return. This increases uh, pressure. So normally the stressed blood volume is about 25% of the total blood volume. And in our control patients in this study, that's exactly what we saw. A stressed blood volume of, of about 1.2 liters or so in the control patients. When we look at patients with HFPEF, slight increase in total blood volume, but a much more dramatic increase in stress blood volume. Why would you have an increase in stress blood volume? Well, this is, this is importantly regulated by the autonomic nervous system. The biggest capacitor in our body that stores blood um, is in the hepatosplanchnic veins. And when there's an increase in sympathetic outflow to those veins, it basically causes venoconstriction, which squeezes blood back into the central circulation. And these data suggest that that plays an important role in contributing to the higher filling pressures in patients with HFPEF. These abnormalities at rest become even more dramatic during exercise where patients with HFPEF develop a substantially and significantly greater increase in stress blood volume, altering the distribution of blood volume as compared to normal control patients. Uh, there's ongoing trials which are trying to um, interrupt this pathology by causing um, splanchnic nerve ablation through an endovascular procedure. So this might be an important uh, therapeutic target as well. Uh, in addition to fat in the abdomen, these patients with uh, HFPEF and obesity frequently develop uh, epicardial fat. This is an extremely prominent example from a, a woman uh, who passed away um, at Mayo Clinic. And you can see, you know, even, com even when you take non-obese HFPEF, they have an increase in epicardial fat, but obese patients, this is particularly problematic. And this is important for a number of reasons. One is that there's no fascial plane that separates the epicardial surface of the heart um, from this fat depot. So things that are um, elaborated in the epicardial fat, such as inflammatory adipokines or um, mesenchymal stem cells may travel down into the myocardium, causing things like fibrosis, inflammation, and vascular rarefaction. This has been proposed to play a role in contributing to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So that's the obese phenotype, but here's a different phenotype. This is a 82 year old lady um, who uh, presented with dyspnea and she got an echocardiogram and she was found to have left atrial enlargement and a very high RV systolic pressure um, by echo. So she went to the cath lab and here's her data. In green, you can see her pulmonary artery pressure, PA systolic pressure of about 80. In red, you can see her pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with very prominent V waves. And then in blue, you can see her right atrial pressure. These are all very, um, very elevated. Her pulmonary vascular resistance is over six wood units. Remember, normal should be less than two wood units or so. So this is somebody with post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, but also a pre-capillary component. Now, part of this is reversible because when you give her sodium nitroprusside in the cath lab, you do see this significant improvement in pulmonary artery pressures, LA pressures, and right atrial pressures. But again, it doesn't normalize. The wedge pressure and the PA pressure are still high. The pulmonary vascular resistance is still high. This is HFPEP with pulmonary vascular disease. And this is a bit of a different phenotype, again, than some of the others. Remember the formula, mean PA pressure is equal to the product of pulmonary blood flow times pulmonary vascular resistance plus the downstream left atrial pressure or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Now, early on, patients with HFPEF develop an increase in PA pressure that's exclusively mediated by an increase in the downstream left atrial pressure and their transpulmonary gradient or the difference between PA and LA pressure is normal and their pulmonary vascular resistance is normal. But when this left atrial hypertension is sustained chronically over, um, over years, they develop this remodeling process and vasoconstriction so that they get an increase in the resistance um, of, to flow through the vessels. And like I showed in the case earlier, some of this is due to vasoconstriction, but we also know a lot of it now is also due to changes, remodeling changes, in both the arteries and the veins um, of the lung. 
which further lead to an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. These patients look a little different during exercise. Uh, so this is uh, patients with um, no pH. Uh, they have HFPF, but no pH, they're black. Isolated post-capillary pH HFPF is red. And then the dotted line here is combined precapillary and post-capillary. This is their cardiac output at rest and then during exercise. And you can see that Total cardiac output is depressed in the patients with precapillary disease compared to the others, and it goes up less during exercise. All of this remodeling and vasoconstriction that's occurred in the lungs uh, leads to an inability to pump blood through the lungs effectively. So as cardiac output goes up, the pulmonary artery pressure flow relationship is shifted up and to the left. So there's a greater increase in pressure at uh, a common flow uh, as compared to the patients with post-capillary pH and no pH. Now, um, this inability to pump blood through these remodeled lungs, which is due to the remodeling itself, but also due to RV dysfunction, causes a dramatic increase in right atrial pressure. Um, because remember, at steady state, cardiac output is equal to venous return. So you've got all this blood coming back to the right heart during exercise. And if the right ventricle can't pump it out, the right atrial pressure goes extremely high. And it turns out this is very important. The reason it's important is because of what's called transmural pressure. So uh, when we think about preload, we often incorrectly ascribe it to end diastolic pressure. It's not end diastolic pressure. Preload is more accurately conceptualized as end diastolic volume. That's what determines the interaction between the thin and thick filaments in the cardiac myocytes is volume, not pressure. End diastolic volume is more strongly related to what's called transmural pressure. So what do I mean by transmural pressure? Transmural pressure is the pressure within the chamber or the vessel that's causing it to become distended. That's the transmural pressure. The total pressure we measure with a catheter in here is equal to the transmural pressure plus the external pressure that's applied in the heart by the pericardium. So we can solve for the transmural, transmural pressure as the difference between the measured pressure, which we would measure with our catheter, minus this external pressure. Now, how do you measure this external pressure in a living person? Well, it turns out it's very accurate. The pericardial pressure is very accurately and faithfully reproduced by the right atrial pressure, as shown in this seminal study from John Kyberg uh, way back 25 years ago. So, therefore, we can solve for transmural pressure as the difference between wedge pressure and right atrial pressure. So, if we go back to these patients with severe pulmonary vascular disease, as their right atrial pressure goes up, what happens to their transmural pressure? Well, the patients with post-capillary pH and no pH, when they exercise, their transmural pressure goes up. Their wedge pressure goes very high, but their left ventricle is still getting filled with more blood. They're just shifting them farther out on the compliance curve. In contrast, the patients with pulmonary vascular disease, even though their wedge pressure is just as high as these other patients, they actually have a reduction in transmural pressure. So that's because their septum is bowing over and their left heart is getting underfilled, even though the pressure in the left heart is very high. So it's limiting cardiac output in part through an abnormality in Frank Starling Reserve. So this is just an example. If you do um, echocardiography at this time in these patients, instead of the septum being concave towards the right ventricle the way it normally would be, the septum has become flat and the LV has this D shape that's because the right heart is pushing over. And what this do, does in these patients is it shifts the entire pressure volume relationship over to the left, such that the patient has a higher LV end diastolic pressure at a given common LV end diastolic volume. This is happening independent of anything in the left ventricle. This is all due to what's called diastolic ventricular interaction or DVI. And that's enhanced in patients um, with HFPEF with obesity, with pulmonary hypertension, and with um, left atrial abnormalities.
In fact, these patients with left atrial myopathy are more prone to developing atrial fibrillation. And as this happens, as LV diastolic dysfunction worsens, it stretches the LA, causes remodeling, reduction in LA compliance, impaired reservoir function, increase in the amplitude of the V wave. This, this creates this vicious cycle that leads to electrical remodeling, starts off with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but over time, this chronic increase in LA pressure causes remodeling in the pulmonary vasculature, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, prominent pulmonary hypertension, eventually right heart failure, the RV starts to dilate, the tricuspid annulus dilates, you get more tr functional tricuspid regurgitation, the right atrium gets big. These are the patients that are in permanent atrial fibrillation. So this is very much the end stage of HEFPAP. This is more the early stage. We wanna prevent this trans transmission. And it's very strongly tied to left atrial dysfunction and atrial fibrillation in these patients. Back to uh, earlier, when we were talking about the case, uh, you know, uh, we can do invasive testing in everybody, but it's really not cost effective. Many laboratories lack this ability. So we developed this approach to help us determine who needs to undergo this testing uh, using what we call the HEFPEF score. So we looked at a large series of about 500 patients with uh, invasively proven HEFPEF or invasively disproven uh, HEFPEF or controls. And we looked at all of the different factors that uh, separate those two groups. And in this logistic model came up with this score here based on these six variables, BMI, two or more antihypertensives, the presence of a history of AFib, high PA pressure, high EE prime on echo, and then age above 60. And you calculate from this the score. And the beauty of this is that based on this score, you can estimate the pretest probability that a patient with normal EF and unexplained dyspnea has HEFPEF. And you can see that scores above six, it's almost a certainty. With very low scores, it's very unlikely. In this intermediate zone, these are the people that need additional testing. So, um, in our practice, we would take to the invasive cath lab for um, exercise testing. Now, about a year later, guidelines came out from the HFA of the ESC, this HFA PEF score. Um, very similar approach. You're using methods to determine the pretest probability that a patient has HEFPEF. Um, unlike the HEFPEF score, um, there is no clinical characteristics. Um, it's all echo and BNP majors. Uh, but there's major and minor criteria uh, according to the HFA PEF score. If the score is above five points, five or six, they definitely have HEFPEF. In the intermediate range, just like with the HEFPEF score, this is a time when you need diastolic stress testing or invasive hemodynamics. Um, so this is very much the approach we use for diagnosis now. Now, once you've found that it's heart failure and a normal EF, the next step is you can't forget about all the other stuff that's not typical primary HEFPEF that can cause this. So this is one patient who has a normal EF, uh, but it's not HEFPEF. Um, so what is this? So this is the LV pressure in red and the RV pressure in blue. And you can see during inspiration, the LV pressure is going down. And at the same time, the RV pressure is going up. They're 180 degrees out of phase. This is called enhanced ventricular interdependence. And in addition to seeing this in patients with HEFPEF that have pH and things like that, we see this, the most dramatic example is in people with pericardial constriction. And that's what this patient has. This black orb around the heart is a calcified pericardium. This patient does not have HEFPEF. This patient needs to go to the operating room and get a pericardiectomy and they will be cured. You don't wanna miss this. Here's another patient. Uh, also has a normal EF, also clearly has heart failure, but this is not typical HEFPEF. This is macroglossia, apple green birefringence on biopsy. This is cardiac amyloidosis. Very important to identify now because we have specific treatments like tefamidus that can alter the disease course. So very important to make this distinction. Here's another patient. This is uh, the wedge pressure of a 78 year old lady with atrial fibrillation and dyspnea. And you can see a very high wedge pressure with these prominent V waves. Looks like HEFPEF, 
Um, but when you look at the simultaneously measured right atrial pressure, you see even more prominent V waves. And you can see that most of the increase in wedge pressure is due to the increase in right atrial pressure. This is a woman with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Now, this is tricky because tricuspid regurgitation often travels with pulmonary hypertension in HEPTA. But in this lady, she did not have a lot of pulmonary hypertension. And we actually took her to the operating room and did a tricuspid valve replacement, um, and her heart failure was vastly improved. So um, not clear how to treat tri um, tricuspid regurgitation in all patients, but clearly some patients will respond to structural interventions. Here's another case. Normal EF, LV pressure in red, PA pressure in blue, very high LV and diastolic pressure, severe pulmonary hypertension. This is the rest of the data. Cardiac output 8.7, systemic vascular resistance is 560. And then something was done in the cath lab. Anybody figure out what was done? Normally in, in a room, I would uh, wait for somebody to raise their hand, but in the Zoom world, we can't do that. What we see here is that the LV systolic pressure has gone up, the heart rate has slowed, um, and the PA pressure has gone down. When we do the other measures, the cardiac output has dropped from 8.7 to 5. The systemic vascular resistance has increased from 560 to 1470. This is a patient who has an arteriovenous fistula for dialysis access. And this patient has developed high output heart failure. This is different than HEFPEF. This patient can be treated by closing that fistula and removing that volume overload on the heart. So very important to make this distinction. Finally, sometimes HEPPEF is disguised. This is an 85-year-old woman with recurrent pulmonary edema. She got an echo, high RVSP, aortic stenosis, normal EF. She was taken to the cath lab. You can see her left atrial pressure is in green. Her LV pressure is in black, her aortic pressure is in red. You can see there's a gradient between the LV and aorta during systole, indicating aortic stenosis. Severe pulmonary hypertension, mean PA pressure 58. Uh, the aortic valve gradient is 20, which is mild to moderate, but her cardiac index is low. So her aortic valve area by the Gorlin equation is very low in the severe range, suggesting severe aortic stenosis. So does this lady need a TAVR? Well, remember the aortic valve area, according to the Gorlin equation, varies directly with the amount of flow across the valve. And in patients with very low flow, it can be pseudo severe aortic stenosis. So we need to increase flow across that stenotic valve to see whether it's true severe AS or whether it's just moderate AS. In the past, we've done this with dobutamine, but this patient has severe hypertension, as you can see here. So we do it a different way by giving nitroprusside in the cath lab. And when we do that, you can see her blood pressure comes down very nicely. Her left atrial pressure is now normal, as is her LVEDP. Her PA pressure is now normal. Her cardiac output has gone up, her gradient has gone up, but because her cardiac output and stroke volume increased more than her gradient increased, her aortic valve area by the Gorlin equation increased from 0.7 to one. So this is not true primary severe aortic stenosis. This is more moderate aortic stenosis in a woman who has HEFPEF. And the important point here is that uh, uh, HEFPEF and senile calcific aortic stenosis are two very common age-related cardiovascular diseases. And they're, because they're so common, they're statistically likely to coexist in many patients. And the cath lab can be help us to tease apart um, these two different um, entities. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've convinced you all uh, that heart failure is fundamentally defined hemodynamically. Um, normal hemodynamics at rest do not mean that um, hemodynamics are going to be normal during the stress of exercise. Things we look for um, clinically like high BNP, echo things like high EE prime and low peak VO2, they're helpful when they're present, but when they're not present, that still doesn't exclude HEFPEF. Uh, 
and we need to take them to um, the invasive lab to make the diagnosis. Invasive assessment also allows for uh, more refined pathophysiologic assessments and characterizations of these different HEFPEF phenotypes, these patients with the stiff heart, uh, patients with the obese phenotype, pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary vascular disease, left atrial myopathy. Um, and remember, when you make the diagnosis, you always need to be thinking about these things that are HEFPEF masqueraders, things like primary valvular disease, pericardial disease, high output heart failure. We don't wanna miss those amyloid uh, because they all have their own distinct natural history uh, and we treat them differently. So we shouldn't uh, lump those together um, in patients with HEFPEF. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, hopefully I uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, too fast with that. And thank you very much for your attention. This is, uh, we're, we're, spring is coming here. This is my son and this is my house. Uh, the snow is not here anymore, but uh, that was from a while back. I don't know if there's, uh, if anybody has any quick questions, they could either say them out loud or in the chat room. So first, also um, building bridge to, to valvular disease uh, and the mimicked HEFPEF scenario, for example, and the pulmonary hypertension. So all of the di differential diagnosis that we have to think of. Um, and thank you for also going into the details of the hemodynamics aspects with the curves. Alessio, the first question is yours. Oh, thank you. Professor Bollock, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was a, a nice travel through HEFPEF. And uh, I think um, the importance of phenotyping the, the um, FF patients is, um, has emerged very well from your talk. And um, I personally started working on amyloidosis um, mm -hmm. and then switched to a HEFPEF. And at the beginning, it was all about stiffness for me. And it was also the major concept related to HEFPEF. But, but as you've shown with your publication, your data and your studies, there's much more behind that. Um, so now my question is, um, um, you, you briefly touched upon pulmonary hypertension in HEFPEF. This is a particularly um, uh, core subgroup of patients with a poor prognosis. And I think there is a major role there um, for the coupling between red ventricular and uh, pulmonary arterial uh, coupling. Um, so um, what do you think um, we can do against that to improve this, this coupling? Um, I recently read your publication publication on Levosimendan, for example, mm -hmm. and there seems to be some trend-wise, some, some kind of effect. Um, yeah, can you give us some insights on that, some perspective? Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a good question. And that's a really important phenotype, I think, to go after, because as you point out, those people do have the worst um, clinical outcomes um, with pH and right ventricular dysfunction. Um, there's not a lot out there. Uh, you know, there was a, a study years ago of sildenafil that came out of Italy from Marco Guazzi's group, and he saw a number of improvements in um, right ventricular function and measures of gas exchange. It looked very exciting. Uh, but then there was the RELAX trial, and then there was another trial in Europe uh, that uh, looked at sildenafil and were negative. Uh, but those trials weren't specifically targeting patients with pulmonary vascular disease, high pulmonary vascular resistance, or patients with abnormal RVPA coupling who might be kind of positioned to respond better. So there's still hope that therapies that target vascular tone, like PDE5 inhibitors, or maybe even other therapies like um, endothelin antagonists um, could be helpful in these patients. Um, I think we probably need better phenotyping. Um, when, you, when you think about high PVR, we often think that that's reflective of a problem in the arteries, uh, but remember the PVR is distributed uh, across the entire vasculature. So about 60% of PVR is normally on the arterial side but 40% is downstream from the capillaries in the veins. And a lot of these venular changes are more remodeling changes, we think, rather than just um, constriction. So um, you can imagine in some patients, if you give them a pulmonary vasodilator and you open up the arteries, but their veins are still constricted, they're gonna get even higher capillary pressures. And maybe that explains why some of the patients don't do well. So I think we need better phenotyping to understand the patients. 
And then we also need to look at different therapies that can target remodeling in addition to just the vasoconstriction that occurs. And there's a lot of different therapies tar targeting, for example, like TGF beta signaling, uh, bone morphogenic protein signaling that might be helpful for targeting that remodeling aspect, um, kinase inhibitors, things like that. But we really, we have very little tissue that, uh, uh, it's hard to get lung tissue. It's even, you know, we think it's hard to get myocardial tissue, but it's even harder to get lung tissue because it's a very, uh, uh, risky procedure um, to, to do. So most of the study comes from postmortems. But I think that's what we need to do. You mentioned the levocimendin, and we did publish that levocimendin, which you guys use in Europe, right? Uh, we, we don't, it's not approved in the United States. Right. Uh, but as you know, it's an inodilator. And we saw in the, in the trial that it actually improved um, hemodynamics in patients with PH heptap. And we're actually gonna follow that up with a, a larger phase three trial in PHFF with an oral formulation of levocimendin. Um, so, so that we hold, holding out hope for. And you know, there were trials of uh, an oral prostanoid um, that was stopped due to low enrollment. There was a trial of masitentan mm -hmm. called Serenade, but that was also stopped <laughs> yeah. because of low enrollment. So uh, there's a lot of hope. We need more data basically, I think. Yeah. Um, another question, if I may, um, Tobias, um, it's about microcirculation. Mm -hmm. So um, it has always been said that microcirculation could play a role in, in HFPEF, and there are several studies showing the role of microcirculation HFPEF. Do you routinely um, investigate this in your HFPEF patients in the cath lab? We, we, we do it, I wouldn't say it's routine, um, but we do coronary microvascular studies not too infrequently, um, where we measure both um, endothelium dependent and independent vaso, vasovascular function. We give um, intracoronary acetylcholine to look at the endothelium, and then we give adenosine to look at um, smooth muscle function. And we see that a lot of these patients, the majority of them do show coronary microvascular dysfunction, uh, about 75%. And non-invasive studies have shown this too with like PET scans and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's there, it's, it's, and we've recently correlated this with the severity of the elevation and wedge pressure, but we don't yet have a good treatment for this. You know, we think statins and stuff like that, but we don't really know. Um, so it would be... We'd probably do it more often if we had a treatment that was, you know, targeting this microvascular dysfunction. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so Barry, thank you once again so much. We have a couple of questions from our from our chat options here, and the first question is: In what's your stress protocol? Do you do a sling, hand paddling, dobutamine? Uh, how do you? Um, what's your access? Is it the groin? Is it is it jugulary? Uh, yeah, access? no. Uh, good. It's, it's supine cycle ergometry. So um, you, don't, you don't do much uh, with either hand grip or arms. That doesn't lead to much of an increase in oxygen consumption. It's not very much of an increase in preload on the heart. So it's not a very good stressor. So cycle exercise is better. We do it supine. It's easier to do it supine and you get a greater increase in venous return to the heart in the supine position as compared to the upright position. Um, so we get access uh, through the jugular and the radial. If we, uh, that way we can do, um, um, we free up the legs for cycling exercise. And we um, put a micromanometer through a balloon wedge catheter um, that's positioned down in the lungs to measure both wedge pressure and pulmonary artery pressure. And then we do blood sampling from the artery and the mixed veins to measure cardiac output using the FIC technique. Um, and then we measure oxygen, you have to measure oxygen consumption to do the FIC technique. So we have a um, med graphics kit, which is a company here that makes expired gas uh, equipment to do that. So we've been doing this for years. It seems like it's a big production, uh, but we were able to do an exercise study in like 15 minutes. So it's actually not that hard to do. Um, our lab has gotten really, uh, really expedient with this. So it's a similar protocol to what we have implemented here with the actually the radial axis and the pigtail and uh, and the swan gans catheter or the uvular vein and supine cycling. Absolutely. Um, um, and uh, another question. But sorry, Tobias, 
then but you have professor borg you have a high fidelity pressure there and the pulmonary pressure yes that's right yeah yeah so that's i think a major difference it costs also way more it's quite costly yeah yeah there are there are about 600 us dollars for the right. wire that we use and it's single use so it is a bit more expensive mm -hmm. um we use them clinically because the data quality is better but uh, and we use them for research purposes too but it is more costly Uh, so I have a personal question, and that would be in what way does a, a severe aortic stenosis um, show similarities to the uh, arterial stiffness phenotype that you mm. mentioned? In many ways, it's similar because it's a pressure overload, um, but the, the timing of the pressure load is different. Um, it's a, immediate during the onset of contraction. Um, there's an opposition to flow, so it increases wall stress uh, very early, and that leads to a different pattern of remodeling and different changes at the thick, thin filament level, um, and even in the extracellular matrix, whereas when it's vascular stiffening, it tends to be more of a late systolic loading, which um, can cause different changes even at the molecular level. So there's some similarities in that the pressure overload is higher, but there's also differences in the sequence of loading uh, that are probably important. So we have one last question, and that would be, in what circumstances would you measure direct left atrial pressure with a transeptual puncture, and, and where do you rely on, on which pressures? We, um, we really, the only time I would do it um, definitively is when um, either I can't get a good wedge pressure, um, which is very, 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 very rare. <laughs> Um, or if I'm looking at like mitral stenosis or something like that, uh, because remember, you can't rely on the wedge pressure to measure the transmitral gradient because there's uh, damping of the Y descent and uh, the v peak of the V wave is lower in the wedge position compared to uh, direct left atrial puncture. So usually you don't need it. If you can't get a good wedge pressure, usually you can just put a pigtail in the LV and measure an LV pressure. So it's very rarely you actually have to do a transeptal puncture. And, um, you know, that if you do a transeptal, you usually are going through the groin, of course, so you, you're not freed up for exercise. So that makes that more complicated. Okay, I think due to the time and your busy schedule and uh, that it's actually evening in Berlin right now, uh, <laughs> we're done for the day. Um, and I thank you um, from the deepest of my heart that you found the time for this, because I think there's a, a couple of people who find this uh, very, very interesting and um, intellectually stimulating with everything that's going on in the hospitals at this time. It's really nice to get this kind of academic input um, for heart failure and, and other um, side games that are, that are happening around the heart. Um, and for us, the Mayo Clinic, of course, is... Um, it's a beacon, yeah. So uh, it, it's great um, to see what you're doing and uh, see what you're publishing. And I think everybody has a, from our team has already cited you numerous times. So it's great to have a to have a picture and a and a voice and and and, and everything attached to that. Thank you so much for finding the time, Barry. My pleasure. Nice to nice to interact with you guys. Hope to see you in person one of these days. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.